Uh, a very good morning to the respective principal, who Dr. Kenti uh, Tombing, Vice Principal, Dr. Kianindian Vaidhi, our discussion leaders, uh, Reverend Dr. Larosian Songate, Reverend Dr. Zangkulam uh, Aukip, and uh, Madam Hasbi Aukip, uh, the organizers of Vision Lamka, and all the faculty, staff, and students of uh, Rayburn College. Uh, I am Sam, I will be your moderator for today. Uh, as we can see from the video that we just watched, uh, Vision Lanka is a registered organization of like-minded individuals uh, with a very rich experience of sharing their common vision of uh, making Lanka the best place in the world. And I think what they are really interested in is laying the foundations for us to claim someday that we can claim that Lanka is the best place in the world. And so in that light they are interested in having conversations such as this and as we've seen uh, talking to the media uh, publications uh, of their booklets sharing of their visions etc to see if there are also like-minded individuals like them who are interested in uh, or concerned about the future of Lanka and uh, uh, the topic the very interesting topic for today uh, which is entitled uh, promoting a healthy and ethical urban culture our unique urban culture is one of the ten objectives that Vision Lanka seeks to introduce towards realizing the shared goal of making Lamka the best place in the world. And if I am not mistaken, uh, this is, I think, uh, the first event uh, where they are intentionally seeking out to reach to the, uh, the youth, the student community. And so really the idea uh, of uh, organizing this event is to get the feedbacks and ideas from the student community. And so uh, al almost as a way of uh, uh, telling you how we are going to go about it, in our first event, uh, we have three speakers who are going to share, and then in the second event, we are going to have an interactive session. And so that time is really for us uh, to jot down our questions and challenge from, from the nature of the topic, from the use of link, uh, the, the, the adjectives uh, to, to, to our concerns about Lamka. It is our responsibility to jot, to jot down and uh, give feedback as much as possible. So I think this is, a, this is the first event that they are intentionally using to reach out and get to the get the ideas and suggestions of the student community. And uh, if you look at our society, every society, community, or people could go through a transition period, or what we call a period of transition. The Lamka that we see today is not the Lamka of the 80s or even the 70s or the 60s. I remember reading a book uh, written by uh, once the governor of Manipur, Vet uh, Marwa, and he said, uh, I used to come to Manipur to get some peace from the insurgencies in both Mizoram and Nagaland. And this is where he used to come in the 60s to get some peace from these neighboring states. And if you look at Manipur today, I think uh, the coin has flipped, the coin has, uh, the, the tide has changed now. And, uh, and so if you we, if we look at uh, the, the rural and peaceful ambience that Lamka used to have in the 60s and the 70s, is now overshadowed and overcomplicated by the urban settlements and all the complications that come along with it. And so we are here to discuss those issues and any phase of transition brings along with it changes. And, and every generation has the responsibility and the privilege to live through those changes. And changes that can cause an uprooting of our known values and uh, practices as uh, happened when Christianity came. Changes that involve an engagement with uh, or appropriation of new beliefs and understanding. Uh, and today we are in the 21st century. Uh, perhaps the most in, in interesting century for us students today because we are in the threshold of uh, negotiating what the future of Lanka will be like. Uh, we, are in the, we are in a position where we get to negotiate whether we can mold uh, our future or whether we will lay passive and let others allow us to mold us in the direction they want us to head. And so it is, I think, with that intention that we have three perspectives. Uh, people, uh, our expert panelists who are going to speak from three perspectives and some of the questions that I believe they will also engage with uh, are first, what are the roots from which we draw our understanding of who we are as a community? What are some of the roots from which we draw our understanding of who we are as a community? What are we transitioning from and where are we transitioning towards? I think that is the first question that I would like to read out. The second one is, what are the values which we say govern our lives? Uh, the, the immediate question might be Christianity, but what values must govern our lives? Uh, the lives of struggling marginalized community. And so when we talk about Christianity, it is important to 
place it in the context of our political place of being a marginalized community. And so, not only what are the values we claim uh, are governing our lives, but what values should govern our lives. How should we talk about Christianity in a way we can flourish together? And uh, the third question is, in what ways can we participate? And I'm borrowing this, uh, this idea from a, a well-known sociologist. In what ways can we participate, not only as people groups, but think from people groups to citizens? In what ways can we use our cultural ethos to contribute to the laws of the land? In such a way that it is both authentically ours, and it is also both authentically uh, the, the place that India is proud of. And so, these are some of the issues uh, that I think uh, our expert panelists will discuss. Uh, and before I introduce uh, each of them, I will call uh, Pu Elting Aide, who is also a retired IFS, and who is also an important member of Vision Lamka, and the co-in-charge, I think, of the media and publicity team, to come and give uh, uh, the keynote address. And then I'll come up again and uh, talk about uh, the structure of how we are going to uh, organize our program today, and then we'll carry on from there. Dear friends and partners, I am happy to be here this morning. First of all, as uh, our companions mentioned, I would like to thank the Narayvan community, especially the principal and the staffs, for giving us a good place to sit together and talk. The key address, the keynote, to Vision Lanka is well known now. I remember the first time we proclaim our theme of making Lanka the best place in the world. People started laughing, unbelievable, and some even think that it is quite foolish. But I'll, I'll let me tell you this morning, everybody's in very short, how we plan to travel to that place which we call the best in the world. It is not like, you know, invading or scaling Mount Everest. Go up to the top, go up to the summit and come back after one night. We intend to stay at the top. How do we stay? I already think about how we can maintain to stay at the top, at the summit. A discussion like this is one of the reasons or the foundation that we are going to lay so that we can stay at the top and sustain it. Now, we don't intend to travel so fast by jet plane or by four wheelers or by any machine. We intend to travel walking step by step. Talking and walking together, looking at the future of green mountains, green valleys, clear atmosphere and clear river flowing. We will enjoy it. This is how we are going to take Lamka, Shishipur, the base, to the place where it can be called the base in the world. I have heard some people say that Lamka is already the best place. The climate condition, the greenery, the people, same, keep and keep. But what we are going to do now is we are going to show a scene to each and every one of us. And that will grow slowly by slowly. I don't see this thing happening, unfortunately, during my lifetime or during your lifetime. 
But the movement will be going on from generation to generation. What I would like to leave for my children to pursue after I left this place is the same thing that this place would be the place, would be the best place it was. What did your parents leave to you when they died? I looked maybe 30, 40 years ago when my parents left for their next life. What do they leave to me? It is jumping cultivation. If I had to pursue my father's, my parents' occupation, I would be living in the hill and doing jumping cultivation. <clears throat> but that is not sustainable. We cut forests, we cut, you know, acre by acre every year. That will cause shortage of water, change in climate conditions. But what we are going to establish now is by slowly laying the foundation, organizing seminars and uh, talking to one another to put our heads together, to put our knowledge together, to make Lankata this place. So what I would like to add with this, the greatest use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. Now you should live your life doing something that will outlast your life. It will be talk, it will be followed, it will be pursued after you leave the heart. So I would ask, especially the young people, the college students of this bright college, to think about what your future would be. You can make your future. You can become what you want during your lifetime. And not only that, you can live a dream. You can live a movement which will be followed by your next generations. And our team, making Lanka the best place in the world, is what we have today. Thank you very much and I hope I wish everyone a good, enjoyable time here in the college. Thank you. I'll just come up again uh, to read the program schedule and also to introduce the speaker. This will probably be the last time I'm coming up. Uh, let me just uh, read out the program for us. We have just done with the video and the greetings and the keynote address. And we are going to have 15 minutes each from each of the panelists. First, from the perspective of our traditional values and customs, from uh, Reverend Dr. Lal Rosiam Sangate. Then we will have, from the perspective of Christian values and ethics, from uh, Reverend Dr. J. Lamboy Haukip. And then from law and order perspective, Lamka being a growing city, from Hasbi Haukip. And uh, they will take 15 minutes each, and each of the students and also the people who are joining us, faculty and others, are requested to note down your questions uh, and your queries so that we can ask them in the next session. So we won't have time for questionnaire after each topic, but we will have them in the next session. Okay, let me just introduce, uh, they have a long line of uh, uh, qualifications, but let me just read out a few of them. Uh, first, to start with our first speaker, uh, Reverend Dr. Laro Siam Sonate. Uh, he is currently the principal of Evangelical College of Theology and has served in the post since 2017. Uh, very early on, he enrolled for theology, theological studies at Barre Bible College in 1985. I don't think uh, many of us were born then. Uh, he completed his Bachelor's of Divinity in 1990. Still many of us might not be born then. And he began teaching at the Evangelical College of Theology in 1991. 
Uh, he continued to pursue his uh, secular education alongside his theological studies, very rare and very interesting, and completed his uh, BA from Churachandpur College in uh, 1995, and MA in Political Science from Manipur University in 2000. And in 2004, he was selected to receive a full scholarship uh, to study his Master's of Theology at a Western Theological Seminary in Michigan, I think which he completed in 2005. Again, uh, uh, getting a scholars, full scholarship even now, I think, is uh, a privilege. Uh, and so uh, he's also served as the General Director, Evangelical uh, Congregational Church of India between 2004 and 12, and was on doctoral study leave at Concordia Theological Seminary between 2013 and 16. So he has uh, done his PhD, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in missiology. Right? Uh, we'll go on ahead uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Zankolam Haukip, often known as uh, Dr. Lamboy Haukip also. Uh, he is the founder director of Bethesda Khanpo Institute, a center for integrative studies. And I think integrative is a very technical and important term for all of us students to keep in mind. Uh, it aims to give opportunity and hope to the needy, particularly the tribal people, and to bring transformation to children, families, and communities. He, ho he holds a PhD from University of Aberdeen, Scotland, Masters of Theology from a Union Theological College, I think in Pune, India. And uh, prior to developing the Bethesda Institute full-time, uh, Dr. Lamboy served at the Union uh, Biblical Seminary as liaison officer, registrar, lecturer, and then associate professor for almost 20 years. So very rich in experience, and besides uh, teaching and supervising theses uh, at both master's and PhD level, he's also published a, a very interesting and important book called Can God Save My uh, Village, I think from uh, Langham Monographs, right? And, and uh, which was published in the UK, and uh, in April 2019, he left his professor job in the university to come back and contribute to Lanka, and that is where the Bethesda Hanpo Foundation and the Institute comes into the picture. And they've also done many other uh, work under the foundation. Uh, he's introduced uh, some interesting com uh, uh, concepts and, and themes that I think are introduced, uh, interesting for us students, so I'll just read out a few. Indigenous theology through the arts. I think that is uh, something uh, that is very new and very interesting. Indigenous theology through the arts. Unity Beyond Borders Conference is something that is organized in 2013. Rethinking Christianity Seminar, I think, is available for us to see. It's organized in 2014. And he's also in, he come up with something very interesting, again, green theology. Yeah, I think it has to do with theology that is concerned about the environment. So green theology. And he's also offering, uh, if I'm not mistaken, now offering a PG diploma course in indigenous studies, which is one year. I think it began in 2020. And this is a good bridge program for PhD students who are interested in indigenous studies. And for us, for, for people that, uh, from Lanka and Manipur, we have to be interested in indigenous studies. And so, have a look at all of those. You'll have time to interact with him later also. And uh, we also have uh, Madam Hasbi Haukip, who has joined us. She has done her uh, education from Silong, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she is one of the few lady MPS officers in Manipur that we have. And they are one of the most dynamic, along with, uh, along with our uh, along with SP Aukip and also our SP, they have done a lot of good works, not only in terms of maintaining law and order, but in terms of COVID, in terms of participating in seminars and, and, and talks like this, in trying to contribute to the society in a total sense. And so they are not just interested in what is, what we often know as their main work, which is maintaining law and order, maintaining peace for us, but they are interested in, the, as, especially as a border area where we have lots of issues coming up and also as an as a urban area where we have lots of uh, urban-like complications coming up. They are invested, uh, I think, almost 24-7 in, in uh, uh, attending to all of this. And they have also, I think, with the SP together, they have come up with, I don't know if you remember, in 2017 or 19, they have come up with uh, an idea of distributing sweets to people who are not wearing helmets. And that is their uh, drive safe awareness campaign. And so we have two very dynamic uh, leaders, one of uh, them who could join us, who are interested in uh, coming up with new and uh, very uh, creative solutions to the problems that we generally face in our, in our uh, community. And so, without further ado, uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Lal Roshan will come up, take 15 minutes. I won't prompt you, so uh, I hope you will <laughs> be mindful of the time, especially as we are all students, we also want to teach them 
how to manage time. And then right after that, I think without any comments, uh, the next one will come up and so forth. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I count it a privilege to take this time to share with you what uh, what have been bothering me for quite some time and it relates to the topic that we are going to talk about today. And before we get into it, I want to explain that when I set my time for today, I was thinking that we started one uh, 11 o'clock and then we finished by one. I did at one o'clock and so I call a meeting at 1.30. So if our time goes a little beyond that, and I have to leave at one o'clock, I beg that you would understand. All right? Uh, <clears throat> the topic I have chosen today that relates to the traditional values uh, of a tribal society is the spirit of what we call Plomaina. Okay. Uh, this is one traditional value that is deeply embedded in the fabric of our, our social life. And we call it Plomaina in our language, and Tongaina, you know, whatever language you speak. And <clears throat> this is what makes our society, our culture, so beautiful. But has become less popular, uh, or that's what we think, and so I want to tell, talk on about this. I have some definitions here. It is defined as the selfless act of help and assistance to others, even without any expectation or reward for oneself. It refers to a moral code of conduct that demands every people to be hospitable, kind to others, unselfish, courageous and helpful to others, even at the top of self-sacrifice. In short, it stands for selfless service for the welfare of others. There is no word in English that carries the full meaning of what we call Klomaina, and so we will continue to use our tribal word in the course of our discussion. Within a tribal society, how Plomaina Plomaina was practiced? Uh, since time immemorial, people saw their Plomaina to help others in time of accident, calamities, or death, or what we call Sydney, Sydney, okay? And uh, <clears throat> For instance, if a man got shot while hunting in, in the jungle, or someone died in the forest, you know, the community gathers together to bring back the dead body or the injured person. Or if someone is lost and drowned in the river, uh, the whole community gathers together to search for the dead body. And if there is death in the village, the community gathers in the home and sit with the grieving family. While the young people proceed to the graveyard to dig the grave and give a decent burial to the dead person, all these things are done without expecting anything in return. This is what we call helping those in need uh, at the expense of your own time and resources without expecting anything in return. This value, this traditional value is being taught and inculcated in the lives of our forefathers at all levels. This beautiful traditional value of Plomaina is uh, something, a legacy we inherited from our forefathers, but that blends so well with the formation of our Christian character. And so I would like to talk about uh, what we can see, a little bit of what we can see from the Bible. There are many instances in the Bible. Uh, one, one of them is that exhibited in the area of hospitality. You know, it is said that in Bible times, people believe that you see God in the face of a stranger. And so they would do anything to entertain strangers. This reminds me of the story of Lot. 
you know, when when the when he received three heavenly guests, uh, they were about to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then uh, the whole community came, broke into the house of Lot and said, "We want those three guests that you you have. We want to molest them." And Lot said, "No, please, my fellow villagers, please, please." I will give you my two virgin daughters, do what you want to them, but please spare my guest. You know, uh, the thought of giving away your daughters to such people, uh, it's, uh, it sounds really bad. But we have to see, what, uh, you know, the extent of care and concern they have for their, for their guest, for the welfare of their guest. And then we come to the, to the New Testament, uh, we see the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the Good Samaritan uh, <coughs> forgets about what he was to do and tend to the sick person who was lying on the roadside. And then we have uh, instances of how Christians get together in the book of Acts and share their belongings, you know, to help one another. And finally, we have the person of Jesus Christ who gave, who gave his life a ransom for our sins. So in all of this, we have this selfless sacrifice, selfless act for the benefit of others. This is what we mean by Dong Laina. And so uh, we see Jesus Christ as a perfect embodiment of this value that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, in high esteem. Today in our society, we have, uh, especially uh, elder people, you know, complaining on the decline of uh, long line up, within our tribal society. This may be true, but we have to understand that uh, times have changed, and so are lives of uh, people. In olden days, when life revolved only around the village, the fields, the hunting grounds, people find much easier to respond to deaths, accidents, and other calamities with the spirit of uh, Tonglaina. But today, our lives are not that simple anymore. Most young people are students in general. Uh, they have their educational obligations, uh, work on assignments, academic deadlines, etc. Many adults now work in offices with limited uh, leave, plenty of workloads and commitments, etc. Many daily, daily wage earners must work and earn or go to bed hungry with a uh, hungry stomach. And besides the demands of what we now call essential commodities like uh, uh, which are considered as luxury in the past, like refrigerators, washing machines, TV, safe addition to four-wheelers, etc., etc., are all consuming our time and our resources, and therefore our, uh, <coughs> our ability to, uh, to volunteer for such kind of emergencies have become so limited. And so there is uh, a sense in which the, uh, the spirit of long line is on the decline. It is true that times have changed and so are our needs and our capacities to render help to those in need. But we also need to take the spirit of Long Laina at the next level. That is my main concern uh, at this time. For example, today a person who is employed may not be able to give a whole day to search a missing person in the forest. Uh, or a teacher may not have time to volunteer to dig uh, a grave or bring a dead body home from the jungle every time somebody dies or somebody uh, is lost. Or a shop owner cannot simply close her shop for the whole day. Or besides today, many young people are out of stations because of work or because of uh, studies. We need to understand that the idea of long line need not be limited within, you know, emergency cases. What I call by emergency cases means death, accidents, or calamities. There are different areas where we can accept this period of long line uh, in our day to day lives, and that would make our society, our, our town, our lives much more easier, much more peaceful.
useful. And uh, I would like to bring out one by one. The first thing that we need to inculcate a press is, uh, is respect for others. Do you notice that uh, you know, some, many of, our, of you are young people? You may, not have, you may not have any memory of the olden days when uh, younger people have shown so much of respect to the uh, older people. It is not just respect for elders, even respect for parents is on the decline. There are different uh, areas where, uh, I'm sorry, in olden days, you don't, you know, when an elder speak, the young people listen. But today, even if the elders speak, the young people talk back. So we not only listen, we, we not only talk back, but we also argue against our parents, against our elders. There is a decline of respect for elders within our communities. This is something we need to inculcate respect for. Uh, you look at this, uh, you know, uh, let, let's talk about the nearest people, the Mayday Society. You look at, there is, uh, they have so much respect for the elderly. Uh, this is something that is, uh, we see uh, fast decline. And the second thing I want to talk about is, uh, my time is fast, uh, cultivate a spirit of courtesy. I do not, uh, one thing about our people is that we are so stingy when it comes to being courteous. I do not mean that we are not courteous among friends and neighbors, which we are all very good. Let me explain. Go to any office, especially government offices. And if you know, if you don't know anyone there, you are sure to have a difficult time because you know visitors are normally ignored. More, uh, most visitors do not know whom to approach when they go to offices and are often in, often in need of guidance with regards to what they come for. Those are times when we need to be courteous. If you are working in that office and a visitor comes you know, uh, welcome them, talk to them, explain them. You are there working, you know, you know everything, nook and corner, but a person come, a visitor come, he doesn't know where to submit the form, he doesn't know where to take the fine, you know. Those are times when we need to, you know, exhibit our spirit of our long liner and then be helpful, be courteous uh, to visitors. Not only in government offices, even in shops. I have been to several shops. There are shops, you go there and you look around, nobody speaks to you. You know, I have deliberately left several shops because <laughs> nobody took notice of me. But there are shops you go, they are very courteous. How can I help you? What do you want? You know. There's one big chain shop, uh, chain store in America called Walmart. In Walmart stores, at the gate, they hired, specifically hired people to greet visitors. You know, you go to the shop, they say, hello, hi, that's all they say, but they make money out of it. You know, people give much importance to courtesy, hospitality. And this is what we like. I have been to several government offices. I'm talking about government offices. I think uh, charge offices and private offices are uh, maybe doing a little bit better. But there are some places where I go and you know you talk to them and then they hardly open their mouth and then you, they respond to you by simply mumbling. I have come across several. You know, when you go and visit an office, whatever office it is, you don't know, you are a stranger there. You don't know the system, the rules, how, where. And those are the times when those of us working in offices needs to show a spirit of long line up. You know, take the initiative to help them, to show them uh, what to do. And the third thing we need to do away with, within our society and which is 
uh, blatantly against the spirit of long line that is the Tsar Takulaba syndrome. No? Tsar Tak, I call it Tsar Takulaba syndrome. You go to one office and you cannot process your file until and unless you give something. And I have a saying, I have a saying that, you know, some people say that uh, plain people are much cheaper for that. Tribals are much more expensive. I think we are, we are people who are very difficult to please. Plain people, you give them 10 rupees, zare zare wazat okay. And then uh, you come here, Lamta, and you give 10 rupees. It did not even cost a peck of Kompuva, you know. We are more expensive. This is uh, so rampant in our, especially in our government offices. You know, we are paid to do those things that we, we demand. You know, we demand Zatakna, we, we get our salaries. The people who came, they don't even have a job like us. We have regular income. But we still want, we still want extra money, you know, to do our work, to do our duties. That is, this is not us, you know, we try on people who have a culture of uh, Tongaina, you know, we, uh, we, we spend the whole day to rescue people, we, we do everything in our power, resources to help people, but when we sit in a government office, we, when we are sitting in the office, and when th things like this come, we expect, you know, we expect Zatakna. As long as we have this system in our town, I think we will never have a beautiful society. This is against the Christian principle of morality, and it is also blatantly against the spirit of Tom Maina, which we have been inculcated. And then, the, I want to tell my experience, but the time is all, uh, coming to an end. Let me finish up. For inculcating honesty and integrity in dispensing our official duties. Today our workplaces are the best platforms where we can show no my love. You know, a teacher may not have the time to volunteer to search a dead body in the river. But he can show no my love by diligently teaching a student and even if necessary giving extra Afford to bring up a stu students, those are lagging behind in their studies. A government worker cannot volunteer to dig grave every time people die in the locality because of the demands of his work, but he can show his strong line up by being faithful and honest in doing his duties. One more, one more thing that often bothers me is that one cannot trust receipts anymore. One cannot trust receipts anymore. I am told by one mystery who works for a person. He said that his employer sent him to buy 40 cages of steel. He said he bought 35 cages of steel and he was able to produce a receipt for 40 cages of steel. Well, mysteries are, you know, they dreams and they misbehave and maybe they are untruthful, but I am concerned with the shopkeeper that issues 40 cases of receipt when he buys only 35 cases of steel. You know, we don't, we cannot trust receipts anymore in our society. There is so much of this bias. These are the things that are against the spirit of Tom Maina, and these are the things that are eating away the very foundation of our society. So the saying that Tom Maina is on the decline in our society is true, and it is partly because 
we compartmentalize uh, within the limit of emergency cases like death, you know, accidents, calamities. We need to bring this spirit of long line out of that, you know, compartmentalized box and bring it out to our workplaces. You are a man of Tom Maina, Tom Maina. So that in the place where you work. We, are, we say that we are by nature a Tom Mai, Tom Mai people, but we cannot be a truly Tom Mai people until we bring this out to our workplaces and let it freely and thoroughly permit our mindsets and our actions at all levels, in the home, in the society, in our workplaces. This is one beautiful character uh, trait that is so in line with our biblical teaching and our Christian character. And it will come a long way in making our town more beautiful and more worthy of place to live and to enjoy. Thank you very much. Kevin Harris, so I thought I took some of my books, but uh, I took only this one, so I want to give um, some copies to the library and then a few of them to uh, our community today. Um, this book I want to present to uh, our ma'am, so she didn't come, but um, I request our ma'am to please hand over to our. Is the 
is something that they want to do. They want to promote it. What is English, by the way? English is some people's language. It is not special. We need English only to communicate. Only to survive. Nothing more. Our mother tongue is equally human language. Therefore, if the vision of Lamka, Lamka vision, the Lamka is really interested in making livable, sustainable community, I think this is also one area that I humbly want to uh, put before them to reflect the future. Thirdly, look at your list who are there. In, recently, one of my students was writing a thesis from Nagaland. You know, the idea in Nagaland is Nagas for Nagaland, Nagaland for Nagas. That is very difficult for many people in Nagaland. So I, I suggest that. Why don't we do point the new term, Naglander? Naglander. Yeah? Naglander is it's, it's a good, inclusive term. Anybody who lives in Naglander is Naglander. Yeah? Before the COVID came last year, I organized Lanka Pastors Prayer Fellowship. I realized that on that some people didn't want to come because of Lamka. I don't know how many people will be disappointed with me standing here when the visa Lamka is organizing. <laughs> that is part of the religion that we face. So we're not so much interested in the name. Yeah. Lamka or whatever it is. We are interested in the people. People who live in this land we call Lamka. Of course, we have to come up with our own name. The official name is not given by our own. Therefore, it's always good to come up with our own name. But that's acceptable to everybody who lives in this area. Another one that I want to humbly place before the others. Now, my task is um, to speak on a Christian perspective in developing Lamka ethically unique urban city. So before I do that, I just want to say a few things about what is Christianity. This is this misconception, particularly in this government, our present government, about Christianity. The idea that Christianity is a foreign religion or the Western religion is not true. Young people, please remember. Students, young scholars, remember. You are the, the leaders of, the future leaders of our town and our community, please remember. Christianity is not Western religion. Christianity was born in East and developed in different forms, in different parts of the world, in which we are part of it. So Christianity is not something that any community or any nation can claim ownership of it. Because it is a faith, it is the message of love in which every nation of the world find life meaning and hope. Therefore, Christianity is world Christianity. Christianity is our religion. It is not a foreign religion. The ideologies, the programs, the activities, we, we, we begin to see and experience these days demands that the right understanding of what is what this is called Christianity. Christian is the power of us, we have the power of Christianity. So, Christianity is no, not Western religion, but is world Christianity, in which we share a part. We are equally part of this world Christianity. So, that's what first thing that I want to do to create this. Confusions to come, and all that will come, but please keep.
Second, before we talk about incorporating certain values in developing albums or, or ethically sustainable urban society, I also want to say something about urbanization. Urbanization, I hope you all know, but I want to maybe repeat to those who know already and hopefully say something new about urbanization to some of you today. Urbanization is a mass movement or a movement of people in mass to towns and cities. Making cities endless, expansion of cities endless. And that is the impact of systems and values. When the whole world was divided into two, capitalist and uh, socialist or uh, 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 the other one in the, in the east and the west. So that's when the end of these two different world has come. What we call free market system has come. In this free market system, there is no protecting wall. Everyone is made to run in the, the same race. This is called globalization. So, urbanization is part of globalization, which is because of the change of economic system. In other words, we are here, not because of our own choice, but because something is changing in the outside of us. Therefore, we are we are affected by the wave of changes in systems and values. But in this urbanization, as I mentioned in the beginning, everything is not something that to be celebrated. When people come from villages to town, not only us, but the whole world is suffering because of this. This in particular, particularly in the global south, for example, in just more than 30 years of time, that China has experienced one of the fastest growing urbanization in human history. China, for example. If you go, if you ever come to Dubai, Dubai is artificial. It was desert, but now a very good city. Again, part of urbanization part of this globalization, change of free markets, all that. Now in this, what we see here, the similar thing happened in 18th century, in 19th century in Britain. Because of this, there's a lot of social problems, a lot of psychological problems, and spiritual problems as well. One of the writers was saying that this is the urban pathologies, urban pathologies, which means negative impacts of the urban urbanization that people face. So this is what we're going to face in the days to come. There will be, there will be um, far-reaching negative impact of urbanization. In 2015, um, in the, in, in, because of the ethnic conflicts in Syria, um, Alan Kuldis, the three years old boy, the family fled Syria, the Kuldis uh, family, to Europe in the boat. But what happened was he died in water. So in one of my writings I said, Alan Kuldis died while fleeing from death. Yeah? The boy died while fleeing from death. Urbanization can be the same thing. We come to the city for so-called development. But in this, in search of development, many will lose their life. Many will lose their life. Now this is where my reflection comes in. How do we as Christians 
respond to this? What are the, are the, the challenges of urbanization uh, that we're going to face? So a few things I want to say. Um, we can foresee, we're not prophets, we don't want to be prophet also, but then based on present experience, we can say something about the future. One, in Lanka, there will be abrupt cultural upheaval, sudden change, having negative impact on the society. People from the village will not be able to practice their culture in a town. Their life, their culture will be abruptly ended. Their worldview, their relationship will not be able to continue. Feeling of self-esteem. They'll feel less about, less value about their life, their culture. That's one. We're going to face that one. Second, there will be social segmentation in society. The rich and the poor, the, the fast-growing elite, few elite group enjoying the wealth of them. This group will not happen. Maybe the ordinary happen. There will be also division based on tribe. Now we are not so interested about tribe, we are interested more about the plants. Plants, yeah? Tribe is too big. Now we are interested in plants. Yeah? We are so divided, divided, divided. Disintegrated. So this will come. Will come more, we will see more. The growth of the powerful and prosperous, a few that it will that will make the poor poorer, dependent. One urban sociologist, famous urban sociologist, he talked about a group of people who have literally deleted their names in the government statistics because they were too poor. They were too poor. They were a sham of the community. Therefore, government literally deleted their names from the statistics. Then what happened? Drug addicts. Why drug addicts in children poor so much? Again, something to do with the system. <clears throat> the way we think. Exploitation of natural resources. The river, the trees, all that you all know. Recently, I had a privilege to visit some of the interior places, places in our community. Terrible, the way we treat, the way we see nature. Exploitation of the poor. Exploitation of nature. Finally, slavery. Slavery and worship of mammon. Materialism. Consumers' culture. All these are part of the case of urbanization. How do we respond to this as Christians? Now, one I'm going to say, maybe briefly, you make three or four points and I'll stop. The first thing I want to say this to my friends here. Please discern and decide what is the most important thing for your life. The most important thing for your life. Is it wealth? Is it career? Money? Think about it. I live in Western country many years, both Britain and America. The richest people, and they have lots of lots of problems, mental health, mental illness, depression, all that. If they have money, why do they 
have those things. That shows that wealth and money, they are not the best, they are not the most important thing. The most important thing I want to say is to you, I know you are Christian, but do you think you are Christianity? You are born as a Christian family, therefore you are Christian. But think for yourself, the testing will come in so many ways. Ideology will come in so many ways. From all sides it will come, but you decide what is the most important thing for you. I would suggest that God. God, I think, believe in God, I think personally for all of us is the most important for us. Be careful. If you're not careful, if you're, if you're not serious about this, our society is hanging just now, in my view. We have no root. 100 years of Christianity is simply talking about what other people talk about Christianity, Western Americans and British theology. We have not talked about our own Christianity yet. This is the failure of the present church leaders. We have no theology. We have no, we have no indigenous theology yet. One. In the process of Western or modern education and Christianity, we also lost our culture. So without faith and culture, we're handling like this. The danger is in the present situation, when ideologies are coming to us. <coughs> now, before Christianity, you were actually a Hindu. That's what the idols is coming. Be careful. Yeah, unless we have rooted in our own culture and faith, I tell you, our identity, our land, our culture, everything will go. Development for indigenous people is expensive, dangerous, and risky. Unless we are careful about what is coming behind. Therefore, choose what is the most important thing for your life. I suggest that you believe in God. Trust in God. One. Second one is this. <clears throat> See yourself from the from the perspective of God. I mentioned that we'll be divided more in the future in the future. Tribe wise and all that. Urbanization means more people coming in. But unless you know how to see, how to understand this, we'll be in trouble. So we have to see from the perspective of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. In heaven, every tribe and nation is there. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, In Christ we are reconciled. In reconciliation, you don't give up your culture. But then you are one with others. That is very important. Accept everybody in Christ. That doesn't mean that you leave your culture. But what means is that you are not boasting. You are not looking down upon other people because of Christ. Do. Thirdly, be sensitive to the needs around you. Be sensitive to the need around you. In other words, see people from the eyes of God. This is what the biggest temptation. We are all for development. Yeah, all that. We want to go far, far, and then we want to live in America, Britain. That's what we want. But then be sensitive to the needs around you, if you're Christian. Very important. I don't have much time. Let me go on. The next, <clears throat> create some care. In, in pursuit of money and wealth, we have destroy everything you have, including nature, trees, rivers, birds, all that gone. But I tell you, if all this is gone, we cannot understand heaven. Because heaven, we talk about tree of life, living water. If there is no good river, how will we understand heaven? How will we going to understand God? Therefore, trees, all this, what God said in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Everything is good. Who are we to, to treat them less important? Very important. Again, I don't have much time. Just a few things. 
and remember. Land, for example, in our culture, we, we, we never, our foreparents born, never sell land for money. We commercialize land now. Again, this is very important. Land from perspective of God is a gift. We are only caretaker. We cannot own land. No one can own land. Land is from God. That's a gift. In fact, land owns us. Land owns us. This is again it's a change of worldview that we need to be critical and prophetic about it. So therefore, what I want to say is this. Urbanization is good. I guess we cannot stop it. But we have to develop this using our own culture, as Pussy Mabu say, and faith in the Bible. If we are rooted in these two legs, foundations, then we can talk about sustainable urbanization. Thank you very much. for this opportunity and uh, our speakers, very learned speakers uh, who have spoken before me, they have touched all the aspects of urban um, healthy and our, uh, our topic of our healthy and ethical urban culture which we should develop for a beautiful and um, what do you say, the best Lamka town we have. They have all spoken about it. Uh, I'll be speaking in the perspective of law and order situation. See, when we talk about ethical ethics uh, in legal sense, uh, there are many def uh, definitions, urban dictionary definitions and all other definitions. But uh, of what I understand, uh, ethic or ethical in legal sense, is that um, the, lay the laid down laws, rules and regulations, if followed, if followed, they're morally and legally correct, will maintain stability, security, and prosperity in our society. Oh, our laws have all the aspects to maintain stability in the society, to maintain security of the society, at the same time, to uh, carry forward the society to a better future. So prosperity of the society, everything is covered when we talk about law. So if we follow the rules and regulations, lay down laws ethically, like correctly, then everything is there for our better society. With this, I'd like to start my small presentation. I'm not a student of uh, uh, art stream, philosophy, science, uh, philosophy, history, or uh, political science. I have no knowledge of it. Uh, but as a person, as a society, I understand, and as uh, I have read from uh, some good authors, that they have divided uh, the concept of ethical city, ethical urban uh, society, into four dimensions that there should be ethical leadership, ethical governance. That is one point. Second point is ethical planning, which our government also focus. Ethical plan uh, planning means uh, laid out of our urban, uh, urban cities, like drainage system, uh, drinking water uh, system, or our waste management, our road system, our transport system, our healthcare, everything with, it comes under planning. So our government is also trying for ethical pl planning. So we have good cities in India, like planned cities like um, Chandigarh. Chandigarh is considered as one of the planned uh, city which the go government have established. Otherwise, our cities are like, uh, for example, Lamka, Lamka city, uh, Chochanpur town. A uh, few villages, uh, let's say a few villages here in Selman area, a few villages here in uh, New Lanka area, uh, Lanva area and Tribong area, they were small villages. And then other villages, other uh, 
colonies, other banks, they add up, and then we simply grow into this Jochanpur town. So it's not a planned society, but when we talk about ethical, uh, ethical city, there is a need for ethical planning. That means our transport, how our transport system will be, how our road system will be. That is the second aspect of uh, ethical uh, city. Then the next concept is ethical business environment. That means there should not be monopoly of only one, uh, one company in, uh, what do you say, they should not be a monopoly and they should not be holding all the uh, economic powers like in uh, Chochangpur town. Not only one shop which is, uh, what do you say, controlling all the business of uh, Chochangpur town. It should not be like that. But there should be ethical business environment where a small uh, business man like me or a small uh, vendor, uh, vegetable vendor, also have an opportunity so that they grow in uh, ec economic terms. So there should be ethical business environment. And the last is ethical citizens. This is the most important. We have ethical leadership, but we don't have ethical citizens. We don't follow laws. We are just a <clears throat> bunch of goons. Then what is the use of good planning? What is the use of uh, business environment being there. When the people, the citizens are uh, ethical citizens, then only the people will develop ethical uh, business environment. These are the concepts of uh, established, renowned authors. It's not my own viewpoints. Uh, this is what I'd like to put forward. Next, now coming to the practical terms. So our government have also thought about ethical planning and, and uh, improving the lives of our urban society through Jawaharlal Nehru, Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, which was started by the previous government, which we call as uh, Congress government, but which actually is the PA government, have started this. Later, this the present government have followed it but have given it another name as Amrut, Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation. So government is also giving such a importance to urban planning. So our Chochanpur town also, uh, whenever there is a new village being formed up, a new venue formed up, uh, I'd like to request uh, the leaders, um, the headman, the village chief, that please start thinking about urban planning because we are part of urban uh, Jochanpur now. We have to think about the roads, we have to think about future, not only the present situation. So <clears throat> now coming to the our local experience, the law and order uh, perspective. There are various other issues uh, and we Jochanpur town is very um, blessed that we have all urban am uh, amenities. So with these urban amenities comes uh, it started with petty crimes of theft, which was in uh, every kind of society, primitive society or urban uh, or modern society. It started with petty, uh, petty crimes, but with the coming of urban amenities and our greed, we have started with heinous crime of murder. Then we, nowadays we uh, talk about sexual assault of women and children. Even small children of five to six years are being abused by their own family members, by their own known family members, they are being abused. So, which way we are heading towards? We are heading towards, what do you say, the negative aspect of urbanization. We are heading towards the uh, negative side. And these days, sexual assault is not only of women and children. These days, the sexual assault of man is also coming up. See, I am very um, balanced person. Whenever I speak about laws, I also give awareness to the man. Uh, one, I like to take this opportunity when uh, when we talk about sexual assault of children, which is POXO Act, protection of children from sexual offenses. Children below 18 years are considered to be children by law, and their decisions is considered. Uh, that they cannot take, uh, what do you say, mature decision. So, 
I always uh, warn, here also I like to warn, whenever you are in a relationship with any girl, boys, for boys, please see that the girl is 18 years and above, the marriage age and the legal age. Because you are in a relationship with the, that girl, and these days we are very uh, open-minded, and so I have no hesitation to say that we involve in uh, sexual practices. And the parents come to know. The children are that girl is 16 years of age. But as per law, she cannot take up, uh, what do you say, decision. So you are liable. You have, you have persuaded that girl. It's not her consent. Even if she has given you consent for the sexual act, but still you are liable because uh, she is not of legal age and you, are, you have persuaded that girl, you have, uh, what do you say, nang in ama what they say is like, uh, although she is mature enough for you, for the society, but nang in that girl, so you are still liable. So this is one of, I like to go away from my topic, uh, this I have taken this opportunity. So there, uh, so we have been involved with this kind of sexual act and this kind of um, um, what is it, crimes. And the next crime we see is economic and cyber crime. We see cyber frauds like uh, you order something and they ask you to pay money. Uh, the most common example is uh, buying of secondhand goods through OLX. They show you good bike. You pay some advance, but they never deliver you the goods. So, uh, cyber fraud is there, economic frauds are there, and nowadays, pornography, cyber stalking. Girls are being stalked on Facebook, stalked on various social medias, and our girls are, you have to be careful. You share your intimate uh, videos, you share your intimate photographs, and that is the basis for. Blackmailing. So you have to be uh, very protective of your, your privacy. We talk about privacy whenever uh, anything, but we don't protect our privacy. Please protect your privacy from cyber space. Uh, this is the various crimes which we face in Churchanpur. So why all this is happening? Because we are. Uh, we have access to technologies, we have access to internet, various things. We have urban amenities. Uh, why this is happening? Because there is rapid urbanization. And with rapid urbanization, I'd like to touch only one point, which is uh, urban migration to Chochanpur town. With urban migration, we have mixing of socio-cultural identities. People from various rural backgrounds are coming here and settling. And we all have various uh, uh, identities. We have various thinking. We have various way of per perceiving things. So all these identities, all these thoughts are being mixed up. And there is a rise of political aspirations. We all want to rise uh, to certain level. And due to migration, there is dissent of local way, youths. Local youths, we feel like people coming from rural areas are taking our jobs. So the same is in uh, other parts of the country. And they feel like we are taking their jobs. So the same we are feeling here. People coming from uh, rural areas, they have more physical strength sometimes. And so they can do more things which we don't feel like doing. But we feel that these people are taking away our job opportunities. These people are taking away, um, what do you say, they are occupying our space. They are occupying our Chuchan town. We don't accept them. So there is a descent of local youths. So at the same time, the migrant youths also feel the same, that they are not being accepted here in Chuchan town. So both the local youths and the migrant youths, both are not happy. Uh, living together here in Chanpur town. So this, uh, there is an anger of uh, this empowered working class also. Uh, what is there that uh, there is a disparity in income as we see. Uh, my neighbors is living in four-story building and I'm uh, living in a shanty house. 
So there is a disparity in income and there is a disparity as I envy my uh, neighbors. So these urban disparities increasing. So uh, that means we think that our life is not good, my neighbor's life is good. Our concept of good light here, the country crisis. So therefore, there, there are various law and order situations. The changing landscape of Chochan could have led to various uh, law and order situations. Uh, here, I'd like to point out my uh, points. Like with the changing scenario, uh, what is happening is that uh, our urban culture is moving towards um, these points, following points. Like our people these days who are very much aware of our rights. We're very much aware of our rights as a citizen, so which requires uh, accountable governance. And we are so aware of our rights, which is a very good thing, and it's a good sign of being um, urban settlement, but we are using it in a wrong way, and we are becoming a pressure group. We are using our knowledge of our rights and becoming a pressure group. So the positive side is that we are aware of our rights, but we are becoming pressure groups. Uh, number two, uh, safety and security of the citizens. We are these days talking about women rights, we are talking about children rights, we are talking about, uh, talking about rights of disabled people. Yes, it's a very uh, positive outcome which we see in our Chochanpur district. But the bad thing is, number three, we are segregated based on our ethnicity. We are segregated based on our community. As a human, there, uh, there is a nature that we tend to settle in the area of um, same community. We tend to settle where a uh, person of my ethnicity is there. But we are creating divide in Chochanpur specifically. We have, to, uh, I, we have to settle within our community for our protection, for our development, but that does not mean that I should be only protective only of our society, my society. That I stay in New Lanka, New Lanka is the only Chochanpur town. I stay in uh, Tuibong, Tuibong is the only part of Chochanpur town. No, every, uh, all the area from Kangbai till uh, Lanva or beyond is Chochanpur town. So this segregation uh, of ethnicity, uh, we, have, uh, we have to look into this again. The next is urban youth and their aspirations. As an urban youth, we have lots of aspirations. I came across a uh, very one nice meme in the internet that mom, rock is not a piece of life, it's a way of life. You must all have seen it. Uh, we feel that rock is not just a place of life, it's a way of life. We are so much influenced by other culture, Western culture, rock music, the rock culture, or Korean culture. What about our own culture? Why can't we develop a culture which becomes as famous as Western culture, as famous as Korean culture, and people start following it? That is what the need of the art. Uh, urban youth is very uh, have high aspirations. Yes, which is good thing. We have to be. Uh, we have to have high aspirations so that we move forward in our life. But the bad thing is, our urban youth are very much into abuse of drug, which is a big problem for our community, for our town. When you have so much aspiration, when you think rock is not a face of life, rock music or uh, rock way of life is way of life, not a face of life, then why do you abuse drug? Drug abuse is them, uh, will hold you back. You will not move from this face of life. If you are high in aspirations, study hard. If you are high in aspirations, um, develop some kind of entrepreneurship not drug abuse. If you start abuse, abusing drugs, you will stay back. You will not move forward. Your aspirations, talking big that rock is not a way of life, it's, uh, it's not a face of life, it's a way of life, but you are 
into drug abuse, you will not move forward. Your aspiration is just words. It's not into action. The next is urbanization planning and various new villages which is coming up, the urban migration which have, we have talked about already. Uh, there is urban poverty increasing. Uh, and uh, in this, I like to talk about easy money, which we all are after it. There, so there is economic offenses like Ponzi scheme, networking system. Like if you bring 10 person under you, you will get 10 person incentive. From where you will get 10 person incentive? When the company is not doing any kind of business. For example, recently More Choice was there, Sarva was there, and other companies are there. Why are we so much into easy money? These schemes, uh, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also. Please uh, stay away from these schemes. Because there is no company in the world who can give you that much high returns. Even companies, big companies like Reliance, Geo, or Tata, or Godrej, they don't offer this kind of uh, schemes. If Tata, Birla, uh, Tata, and all these things could have offered those kind of schemes, then maybe I would think, I will still think about it. I'll still think about it. But out of nowhere, three, four people, group of three, four people are coming and they say if you bring 10 people below you, I'll give you 10% of your uh, increment every month. No, that is not possible. Please stay away from these kind of economic offenses. So these are some of the issues which I can uh, jot down from my um, experience. Now, uh, I'll, uh, I'll come to the later part of my uh, speech, is that what kind of culture, what kind of urban culture we uh, we want? What kind of healthy and ethical urban culture we want? That we are aware of our rights, that we are legally aware citizens, that we reinvent our cultural identity and be proud of it. And then we, are, oh, then we do away with narrow-mindedness of ethnicity and communal tone to everything. Number four, that we uh, as a, a, a youth of high aspirations, we create economic opportunities for our Chanchanpur town. And then lastly, we use sustainable source of energy, sustainable use of energy. Whether it's water, we use water judicially. Whether it's um, solar energy, we use solar energy as alternative because resources are limited. So these are some of the um, what do you say, um, thing which I like to inculcate in us, in our uh, daily behavior, daily uh, life, that we have healthy and ethical urban uh, society in Chochanpur town. So the unique and urban culture which I think we should have is hard work, the spirit of hard work. If you have spirit of hard work, everything will come, fall into place. You will be a person of high inspiration, but if you are a person of hard working, a hard working person, I don't think so. You will feel like doing drugs because you don't want to stay behind. So the unique urban culture which I feel we should have is a uh, spirit of hard work so that uh, the opportunity which we have, I like to highlight, with this spirit of hard work, we can be a center of tourism, taking advantage of the scenic beauty of Kuga Dam, uh, Kuga River and Kuga Dam. Many resorts are coming up, which is an economic opportunity. We can be tourism hub. I like our Chochanpur town to be a center of education. Now it's also it's a, it's a center of education. People from Kapokpi, people from Saikul, and these tribal areas, even from Senapati and Okrul, are also coming to Chochanpur for education, um, class 11, 12, as well as higher education. They are coming to Chochanpur town. So I want uh, our Chochanpur town to be center of education. 
also center of medical tourism. We have so uh, very good team of medical doctors in Churchanpur. And with the coming up of uh, medical college in Churchanpur, uh, we have to be person of hard working. We have to be hard working. We have to be in the in the area of education. We have to be in the area of medical education. And um, last, I like to point out is I want a culture known for its tolerance and leadership. So Churchanpur should be known for its tolerance and leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Uh, before we move ahead, uh, because it's already one o'clock, we're going to make some adjustments. Uh, I'm going to call the principal, uh, Reverend Dr. Ken P. Tombing, to just uh, uh, take time to give the gifts uh, to the presenters. Uh, but that is not the license uh, to say uh, you can leave because we still have uh, one session coming up. But for those who have to leave, uh, you, you, you can do so uh, when you need to. Here's a very nice gift. Uh, uh, thank you. It's a thank you note uh, to who Reverend Dr. Lalu Sien Sonate. Thank you for your contribution to the success of the symposium. We look forward to engaging with you again soon for our collective vision of making Lanka the best place in the world. Regards, Vision Lanka and River College. It's nice. It's bamboo. It's a, it's a bamboo thermal flask. <laughs> the same reading uh, to Dr. and Reverend J. Langboy. Okay. Dr. Samuel G. Maite. Session. And I hope uh, if you look at uh, each of the presentations, uh, you will look. I'll just come up again. Uh, we're coming to the uh, discussion session. If you look at each of the presentation, uh, you will have realized that uh, each of them are presenting. Uh, some of the issues that can come with uh, the, the, the urbanization package but, uh, and also uh, whenever we are discussing an issue the question that uh, has been asked is why can't we develop our own culture for example uh, what is the kind of urban culture that we want to create and so I hope we are uh, ready with some of the questions I don't know how best we will do this uh, it might be helpful if there is someone who goes around with a mic and take, takes the question from the the student community or if not if you're comfortable coming up here and asking the questions uh, then that might also be helpful uh, so uh, we will So I'll take the help of some of the, uh, the uh, staff. Yeah. We'll put one mic here, and uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, it could be in the form of a comment. Said, uh, sorry, presented this, and uh, this is what I thought about it. I really like this, etc. And if you want to present it in the form of a question, that is even better. Uh, they have given you very, very personal and helpful practical advices as well. Feel free to give some. Uh, questions and advices back if you want to. And so I'll leave the uh, mic here for them and if anyone wants to start. 
You can just raise your hands and the mic will come to you. I have this question for our base, Samrita IPS. And then it's regarding the SB. SB. Sorry. I want, my question is this. How are the yield becoming a preserved group by oil and rice? And if that is so, then how can we generalize it in the correct way? What is your advice? Uh, when we talk about rights, the rights comes with duties. So if you know your rights, you should know your duties also. Then you will be able to channelize your rights in the right direction. Thank you. Then my next question is for... My question is that you said that uh, we are com we are commercializing land and that is not good. And then that you also mentioned that uh, we are only the guardian of land and we should not commercialize it. So my uh, thing is, would the society accept that? Especially if you say it to the real estate investor, would they agree with that? And do you have a strong background to support their claim? Because I like the idea. <laughs> Are you a student here? No. No. Student. Student. Yes. So, are you planning to look for a job? Yes, sir. Currently, uh, I'm planning to see some of her by present. Okay. Do you know your what? How much your cost? Your cost? How much? What's your cost? Priceless. Priceless. That's correct. No. When you look for a job, possibly you may not get a job easily. So you go to Delhi, maybe Bombay, look for uh, maybe a uh, course to start with. So um, there you realize your worth, your price. Okay? So you get interviewed. So there you will find how much is your worth. People look for, okay, if I take this boy, how much money can I make in a lesser time if he comes here? Then that girl, okay? Then the guy will take according to the money. So you actually you are not human. Yeah, your human brain is gone. So you are actually money. Yeah? The change of value system. So we talk about land. So our forefathers, foreparents, land is sacred. Please remember, land is sacred. Modern education and Christianity somehow brainwash. They have strip us off of the wisdom that we have. So now land is commercialized. What happened now? If you go up there, now actually land belongs to this community. The chief is there, but the chief actually, land was never an individual person's land. But now it becomes a chief for one person. Now, very likely, will there be a war between the chief and the villagers? Please remember, in our society, because we commercialize them. Now, that's okay, but the worst thing will come. The worst thing will come when the multinational companies will buy our land. Then our people become only the workers, instruments, slaves. So we become slaves in our own place. Money goes to the rich people. 
the product will go to America and Europe. I was in I was in UK for seven years. The best thing we get from here, very expensive. So when we commercialize them, the, the end result would be then you move out. Your land belongs to some somebody. I went to um, seminar in the the Lucy seminar, seminar was speaking. So uh, people from Papua, like our own people, the tribal people. So there is good people coming, you not know, like sell all this oil, beef and all that they can. And they took away the resources and the people became slaves. They have to leave their place. So therefore, we talk about development. Development will become replacement if we're not careful. Uproot, uproot yourself. Therefore, I think we need to see. You know, if you're studying here, don't. You see, what are you studying? What is in the book? The book is written by somebody. In Indian context, high caste people. Their wisdom, their knowledge. The more you read, the more you climb up, the more you leave your culture behind. You feel a same of your culture. You worry your religion. That is bad. That's bad. Therefore, you have to be decolonized. Decolonization is not from British people only. It's from Indian people also. Indian, I chose this culture. We're also Indian. But Indian is in our own culture. Many culture. I used to hear in, you know, in traffic, to example traffic, police people, our men said. I used to hear a lot our mother tongue. Nah. But these days I use here more of Mayday language. I'm not against Mayday language, please. But I'm against replacement. If you think your, your language is less, less important than other people, that's bad. Equal. We have to equal. That's the point. So are you human being? Or are you only missing? People make you, you too. So think about it. Something that I, it seems it's, it's too difficult to resist, resist this, this movement. But at the same time, I think we have some role plays, prophetic role play, we call it, no? So, yeah. Does it answer your question? Pulamboy uh, has, I think, mentioned that uh, retaining or reclaiming our um, traditions and retaining our tradition is basic, is fundamental for us. Um, will that not breed more division? Today we talk about unity, you know, like. You know, sometimes people tell me that if we all uh, speak one language, um, we will survive economically. But if we go back to our roots and then try to retain and reclaim our tradition, are we not going backward? Thank you. Um, let me stand so that you can see me there. <laughs> That's very good. I think Buken has asked me uh, before also I find them. Um, who created us? Who do you think? Who created us? God. Or are you coming from a stone like our mother people have said? Yeah? We are created by God. So who is God? God is good. So if the Creator is good and He created us, there must be something good in a culture. But, but human beings are fallen human beings. Therefore our culture, some of cultures are evil, demonic also. So the question is how do we differentiate? 
how do you differentiate? My conviction is that even this culture is also evolving. God, what God has created is human being. We have culture, actually culture actually to evolve from the land. You know, the climate, the environment, the stones, the rock, the river, actually. Therefore, environmentalists, if, if you ask them, these are all important because they affect culture. If all this gone, then we also lose culture. That's how we need to be uh, connecting in our thinking. Uh, my, my feeling is that integrated, integral understanding comes there. What, what we often talk about culture, again, colonization. The British people, African people. Because the idea was, you know, enlightenment thought and also industrialization. They were able to create all this machines and all that, therefore they thought their brain is the best one. Since they can create the best things, they thought their belief was the best one. So they, they, that's how the oldest people you know, come and they came here and they consider as a useless people. So when we talk, our understanding of culture is connected to how outsiders told us about our culture. I think that is that is what I feel we have to decolonize. We have to decolonize. What I feel good about culture is see the way how we relate. For us, you may find me too liberal. But then if you see carefully, in our understanding there's God human and nature connection. God, human, nature connection. That worldview is very helpful. Very helpful for ourselves. Very helpful for nature. Very helpful for God also. See, if we are not here, there will be nobody to put God God. Yeah? Therefore, very important for God also. Understood. So we have to understand our destiny. Therefore, I think what's most important thing is decolonizing self. That's why I think our education has to do with this Latin that uh, this Red Indians, American, Latin uh, no Red Indians, also indigenous people in Australia and in also African countries, they're helpful for us to connect. They talk about decolonization, which is about be our own. What is knowledge today? We talk about uh, this one. We talk about the uh, uh, what do you call uh, in academic we talk about uh, we talk about the uh, See, for us, we cannot have knowledge alone. Knowledge is community knowledge. There's a difference between Western individuals, Western people's worldview, and our worldview. So this time when Western knowledge has come to the peak, they're not able to they're not able to go ahead. Climate issue is one clear example that we see the you know the way we see the Western wisdom has uh, got stuck, you know. Therefore they come back to us, indigenous people, to contribute. I think that's where we have a room to play. In Christianity also, Western Christianity has to climb now. Now, Africans have coming up, we have come up. Therefore, I think this is a time for us to reclaim the opportunity. I will say, I will say that we have, I, I composed a song recently. <laughs> World Christianity song. Um, I cannot sing unfortunately, but uh, in that I say, Heaven is not complete without us. Indian people call us tribal people. Manipuris, they call tribal people. We call ourselves tribal people. Tribal is very low. But heaven is not complete without us. That change your mindset. That means you are so important for God. When you say you, then you are not. 
First thing, I think I uh, have to answer to Pukian also, in my understanding, Christianity has no culture. Christian is a faith. Whoever embraces that faith, they use the culture. So Christianity is something like, so he, so I'm here, for example, I'm talking. So the way he sees me is different. The way the, the bad row sees me, they see me different. I'm the same. But all depends on where you are. You understand of God is different. Therefore, when we go, okay, Jesus, voice is different. How, where your stand is different. So this is how culture comes in. There are elements of culture that are demonic because of sin, but at the same time, they are good culture, which God has given us to use when in terms of difficulty. I think um, which one's bad, which one's good, really depends on more discussion and then in light of the Bible and Christ even. But in general speaking, to say that every culture is bad before Christianity, I think. I used to try <coughs> that, but then I think I changed my view. Because who, who was the one who brought us until 1910 when working robot came to San Juan? Who was it? God. Yeah. If there, if there are two gods, one God brought us until 1910, then from 1910 another God brought us to now. Is that? Well, I think God's one. Therefore, we have to really understand this one. Therefore, I think education can be very destructive. If education is destructive and, you know, dehumanizing, we need to think about it. Paulo Ferris, Latin American educationist, very, very powerful scholar, very helpful. In, in group education, I think, also Christianity, the way we preach also. It has to, when God de delivered Israelite from, from Egypt, God did not deliver only spiritual, the spirit on me. God delivered the culture, the land, the story, the people, the politics. Therefore, it's a holistic thing. That's how I would understand. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. <laughs> And we'll talk more here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I have one question, uh, mainly for uh, um, one boy and the one, the other speaker who left, but unfortunately he left. The question for me is regarding in the perspective of education. Because the youth uh, in Turzanpur and as well as in the context of our own state, uh, education is important, and as education, as one person um, learns more and more, being educated more and more, that even in morality and even in our ethics, we become more wiser and wiser. That goes along too. But education, what we know uh, today by the students and even our own parents is that, by the community is that, once a person been educated, we need a job. Job is for a must. Without a job, as what we see today, education has no meaning. And what is job for? It is to earn money. Because without money, we cannot live. That is our survival for everybody. Because once we step out of the homes, uh, money rules. We need for taxi, we need for drinking water, anything. So, uh, in this education, after completion of education, whether it may be here in Manipur, or whether it may be in our town, or whether it may be in uh, outside the state, that we have to find job. And as we all know in Manipur, uh, say, leave it behind uh, our town, Lamka. In the context of the whole of Manipur also, regarding job, uh, it is unfair, full of corruption, and uh, there is no much opportunity. So the best is to go outside the state. But in your topic, uh, this is what uh, our team is that promoting healthy ethnic uh, unique urban culture. That is to maintain our identity, our culture. In order to maintain an impact for a better, let's say about the vision Lamka, to have the best place in the world. That shows that we have to stay back here in Chusanpur and you know uh, impact 
in our own way, in our culture, morally, or even as uh, one of the speakers has said, from Laila, etc. But then, if we go outside, it is the purpose of our education, getting a job, then impact on the vision Lanka of our town from inside staying here and outside the state, the impact, there's a lot of difference will be there. So if it is that, what should we do? What is the need of education? What is the importance? What is the, uh, you know, the future plan for education for our present students? Because they need a job. In Manipur, it is not. So the impact from outside, uh, let's say, we don't expect much if we don't stay back here. So if we have to be here, then what will we eat for? Just by talking culture, identity, without money, because uh, even in our own town, and not only in our own town, say in the context of the state also, we have less resources, no hardly job. So without money, even if we talk about culture, culture, you know, without survival money, what can we do? So what is your perspective on these, uh, my question, sir? Thank you. I don't think I can answer the whole thing, but many part of it. Yeah. So, so you are a teacher? Okay, what do you teach? Uh, I taught history department. History? Yes. Okay. Whose history did you teach? Uh, I taught uh, on all subjects. Okay. All subjects of history. Okay. History, sometimes it's a history. Do you teach your, our people's history? Uh, that's the moment of the history class for that. Okay. No syllabus. Uh, no syllabus. No syllabus for the indigenous uh, tribes. Ah, so who's mistake then? Uh, Why is that? Because there's no money. Uh, it's not yeah, yeah, money. Yeah, like yeah. 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 See, see, I asked you the question because of that point. Huh. Why? Why is that you teach history and you, you do not teach our history? Why? I ask. I'm not blaming you, but then I ask the system. Because we're tribal. Hmm. Who's tribal? Useless people. Yeah. Christianity also doesn't accept. Modern education, money education doesn't accept. Indian education doesn't accept. We also don't, don't accept our culture, our history. Therefore, no money. So, you're right, you're right. But again, let me ask this, this thing, okay? You can be expert. See, your, how you develop your self-esteem. You develop your self-esteem when you are able to give something to people which they don't have. <coughs> you cannot be expert in other people's history. They are there. So, we have no platform because of the system. It's only when system allows us to talk about our culture, then the money, because it's not a system. When this this six year in Indian, I'm talking about different politics, but you know, it's all connected. Why is that? We, this thing is not it's just a system because you don't have government. We have no right to help. We have no autonomy. We cannot design this thing. Young people, students, please get this to say that you must be interested in politics. I'm not talking about politics, but politics is very important part of our survival. We're not talking about bad politics. We're talking about good. Politics please allow you to include your history, your culture. Then, then only you can be expert. Then money will come. One of the good things in global ideas and global philosophy is that communication. And so this is again very bad in many ways, but then a possibility is that you use the system and you can do promote local thing. Okay. Do you have philosophy? Tribal philosophy? Do you have tribal epistemology? Phew! You can't even think of. Why? 
I'm not scared of why you don't have these things. <laughs> yeah. So we have to create it. I told uh, I told um Pookie and all of you, no? Let's make this Rayburn College the pioneer. A pioneer in which we invent, we invent new things. We have to be, we have to join, we have to join, you know. See, uh, world Christianity is sometimes an experience bending of a globe. In a globe, you are asked to join. When you bend, you have to bring your brush and color. Don't use other people's brush and color. That means your culture and your wisdom and knowledge. I think that's how I would say. So, you are saying, is part of the system that we're here, therefore normally the importance of being here, I understood. I found it very difficult too. I lived outside more than 30 years, only last year I came back, I really found it difficult. Survival. But if you don't really do good do it, that is another challenge. This is what God has given to us, this part of the land, the whole world, Actually, Lanka is, is, is a peace center for our people in Burma, Mizoram, and Bangladesh, and everywhere. Best bread comes from here, should come from here, actually. No? Because we're in peace. So again, how do, you, how do we use different dialects, different languages, different wisdom we have? We should not put a war and, you know, separate ourselves, but we have to come together. I would say yes, that uh, maybe we do not next time when you organize, make the one how keep to speak Mal language. One more speak in Paite, like that. We have to learn our language all the time. It's so foolish and a sad to say that I don't know Paite, I don't know Mal. That's artificial. If we can learn English, why not? Your brother's English, you want to understand? And this is also part of the thing. Therefore, we have to. Develop from here. What is there? Wisdom, knowledge, and different things. We are talented people. So I understood your, your difficulty, but at the same time, um, I see a lot of hope here. We have potential, I feel. We have potential. But the only thing is that we have to work together. I don't believe in this tribe division. I, I hate that. I don't like it. Look, this will block our development. So my development, your development. So we have to overcome this. Our, uh, our Dr. Sam was talking about, we talked about the Beyond Borders <coughs> Conference. <laughs> Beyond Borders Conference. So once I brought up people from Bangladesh. You see, before we used to be one, uh, under working robots. Um, but now we artificially divided. So yeah, difficult, but then I, I think that's where we have to work together. And uh, there's a hope. I feel which way potential. Why potential? If God is here. If God is here. If God is here, there must be something good in our culture also. So let us not simply, you know, say everything is bad, but something good. Um, you know, Hanko. I say, if Modi, our prime minister, can internationalize yoga, yoga actually is a Hinduism. Why not Hanko? I say. I spent the concept of to my friends in the UK and the US. The last two years, they observed Kanko Day in Scotland. <laughs> it's good, not only for us, but for them also. In that way, we can also share. We can also share. Therefore, I think we have a potential. And again, this, this is a factory. Raymond Kula is a factory. All the knowledge we have is the raw material. And what we have to create is something from us. When we are able to create that one, people come and buy. Then we get money. And we survive and stay here. Yeah? Thank you. I would like to ask you. <laughs> I'd like to ask you one question. We are talking about uh, protecting and separating our culture. So, uh, according to me, like, uh, why not? We promote our culture, one of our culture, that is on uh, bringing of the rice, uh, sticky wine, beer, the uh, husk wine, that uh, 
that we call it by zoo and all. Instead of our own people, many of our people uh, are dying because of uh, drinking the intoxicated uh, uh, wine and all. Why not we promote that one, uh, our own local uh, rice beer and all, make it very healthy, uh, hygienic, and then instead of uh, drinking uh, other people uh, making, breathing that wine, why not we promote our, uh, that is a part of our culture, so that uh, our people also become uh, rich like the outsiders. So what about, <laughs> let me ask you about that. <laughs> You're asking very difficult question to a pastor. I'm a pastor. See, um, I live uh, outside uh, in Western world. In Western world, you can drink. Uh, you know, flight to all is free. You can drink. But, but I just want to. Meaning that we may have to use our land. 
how the forest act is there, wetland is there, so many things are there. Uh, this is where I think not maybe may, this may not be the right forum to talk about, but then this is where you have to discuss another level. The policies and all this. So is is it coming to Lanka the only solution we have? Or can we do something about there? Uh, as I mentioned the last two weeks, I've been visiting interior places. If you're my, my Facebook then you see some of them. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the chief, some of the chief associations, uh, discuss with them. Now, as I mentioned, because of the, the Poppy plantation, uh, plantation all that, there's going to be um, a war between the, the chief and then the villages in some places. If we don't link together the villages, outsiders will come, they don't have to use them, they don't have to pay money, they just come and occupy our land and then because we, have, we don't have self garden. We don't have this um, six schedule also. Sometimes I feel that we are very sick our society, our land also. So um, our identity belongs to them, not you. So I'm the person of them. Say I'm I'm Bukpi, for example. So Bukpi is the place. If Bupi is, is taken away by somebody, my identity is gone. No. Therefore, I think all this has to be included in the consideration of education. If education is learning only about other people's writing and wisdom and living ours, that is very expensive. So this might be. And then our organization for that, I think, if we can do something about it, I think, let us do something about the villages. Maybe start schools. That's what we did in Burma border. So one church has started school because all the children are coming here. And so when the children are coming here, and you know, there's nobody to, there to be there. So people can come and then, you know, so they enjoy the resources. So we have to change our organization. If we can stop it and this you know, do something about our own places. Because, because without that, you cannot live here for, forever. This is this, this, this not this will support us. The, the, the hills will support us. So therefore I think I think what I say the prophetic voice in the urbanite the making urbanization, the global urbanization, I think that's also part of it. Because we cannot we cannot live only in this small place. Again, but it's part of the global phenomena. So, in Europe, the same thing happened. Uh, yeah. Does it answer some of your questions? Uh, we're slowly running out of time. So, we'll have maybe two more questions. If anyone wants to raise the last two questions, we'll open for that. Uh, you can think about your questions. Yeah, but maybe we'll have two more, and then after after that, uh, you can uh, uh, personally talk to both the speakers uh, if you like to ask some questions as well. So far, what we've been talking about, I think it's uh, the exchange of questions and answers are very interesting because on the one hand we have uh, organizations like Vision Lanka who see it as their responsibility to cast visions uh, that will be realized maybe in 500 years. And, 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 and then we have students and, and teachers and uh, young adults who are asking practical questions about what is the currency of the change that we want to bring about. Let's say uh, we, what we can take for granted is urbanization, however defined, however we understand it, is already here. There is already a change that is happening in Lanka. How do we engage those changes? How do we take uh, the idea of Klongaina into our urban settings, for example, is a good question. But it is not enough to say we have to take it. How do we take it is the questions that I think the youths are asking. It is very well to say we must put God in the center of our lives. But what does it mean? Practically, because tomorrow if I don't have a job, God can mean so many things. Tomorrow if I do someone I love, the definitions of God can change. And, and so uh, those are the questions that the youth are asking, I think. And if, even if we are, and, and, and there's a question about, uh, for example, 
I think I don't, I don't know if I, un I understand it correctly, but there is a question about is Lamka enough to house uh, the creativity and uh, is Lamka enough to house the creativity and uh, the, the range of educated people who are going to be coming out of this place? Where are they going to get job opportunities? Uh, how many Ray Barns should we have? How many Khanpo institutes should we raise? Or uh, how do we understand contribution? I think if you look at the example of Vision Lamka itself, almost all of them are people who are working outside and, 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 and are looking to contribute. And so that it doesn't mean just because you're not in Lamka you can't contribute. If we narrow it that way, then we might not be able to pull all our resources together. And even all our resources will be quite limited. No? And, and there are, again, so many questions I think we can also pose to Ma'am about because in, in a place like Lamka, there are so many organizations. Civil societies are acting as pressure groups, as Man said. Uh, there are, if, if there is a case that police has to handle, there are five, six organizations that are already standing in the way of the police doing work. If they don't get their results in five days, it is your, they will tell the police, it is your responsibility, whatever happens. And so, uh, there, there can be questions we ask about how do we engage uh, following law and order with our Christian values, with our tribal values, or with our very more modernized, uh, still diluted understanding of citizenship, for example. No, so th those are some of the questions that I think even Vision Lanka will think about, and uh, even uh, uh, the speakers can uh, also talk about. But I'll open the question, uh, uh, maybe we'll have two last questions if anybody wants to ask, or anybody wants to have a say. Any comments from anyone or any questions? Yeah, I noticed that uh, some of our students had to go and they left. Uh, so maybe this is half day holiday, uh, sorry, half day seminar. Uh, so maybe it's time to wind up, I think. Um, there are four characteristics, characteristics, I'm sorry, <laughs> of uh, several, several tribes. Uh, number one is uh, primitiveness. You know, primitiveness, I think uh, this, when we talk about retaining and maintaining our culture, doesn't mean that we are being primitive. And number two is remoteness talk about urbanization and so we have to beat this remoteness and our nature is to beat this remoteness that's for people come and uh, who, uh, live in the urban area and number three is backwardness and there's a lot of debate on our tourists backward you know as they demand the uh, settled tribe status and number four is shyness I think as you walk out from here, you will ask a lot of questions yourself. Or you will ask your friend, but you would not ask here. So I think we're still tribal here. You're just so shy to ask. I want to thank uh, the uh, Lanka uh, today for uh, partnering with us in uh, organizing this Vision Lanka seminar on half day symposium on promoting healthy and ethical unique urban culture. I uh, want to especially thank also my staff here who worked so hard to make this uh, function seminar a success. It will be our pleasure to continue to reason, think and work with you, Lamka Vision, to make Lamka Town the best place live in the world. Thank you very much and God bless you. I guess we have a refreshment with a fruity uh, juice, a mango juice and then uh, some samosa. And please enjoy that and God bless you and thank you for coming.